And we're back, Stripe Show Podcast. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thank you for making us part of your day. I hope you are off to a great start in the 2024 calendar season. The first quarter, believe it or not, is complete. We are into April. The Masters is around the corner. Spring golf season for everyone. And today's podcast is about you some things to consider about your own game as it pertains to the full swing and short game. A lot of discussion that we have here is around full swing, short game, and putting technique. And sometimes I got to do a podcast and I got to pull bits and pieces from these discussions that we've had. And I got to peel it back. And I want to, have a conversation with you, just me and you, about your own game, some things to consider. Now, there's so many times where I have a lesson right here in my studio. Today's podcast brought to you by, there it is, the About Golf Simulator glowing in the backdrop. I've got multiple new courses coming my way. I've got a player's ability test that they've designed coming my way that I'm going to be downloading in the next week. Can't wait for that. But there's multiple times that I'm having a lesson here. And it's a scenario or a situation where I'm like, this would be a really good conversation for my audience. They're not standing right here with me, but they follow me. And they know where some of my... um, I guess some of my beliefs might fall, some of the patterns and how I see it, some of the uh, developmental things that I think are important for an amateur player. And and, and my audience is 99.9% the amateur player. Maybe it's not quite that high. I know I have some professionals that listen to this. I have a lot of teachers that listen to this. But for the most part, my audience is the amateur player. It might be a high single-digit handicap. It might be a uh, the average handicap for a male is 16, 29.8 for a female. Men and women who have jobs, who have kids, uh, who have other activities, they love the game, they want to play more golf, but the reality is, is they only have X amount of time to do it, X amount of resources to dedicate to it. So my message for 24 years has been very much to that audience. Now, if you have a lot of time to play and you are very serious about the game and, and, uh, and you want to work with a, with a uh, teacher one-on-one, man, you, you are positioned to do some great things because golf requires reps, right? It requires not only great information, but you've got to, and, and then they got to be able to take it and work on it, develop it, come back, get feedback, uh, go through success, go through failure. And this, this journey just continues and continues. And it's a little easier to go from a 30 handicap to a 20 than it is to go from a 20 to a 10, than it is to go from a 10 to a 7, than it is to go from a 7 to a 5, 4, 3, 2, just gets progressively more difficult. And so today I want to shed some light on for some things for you to consider as you head into the spring season. I'm going to challenge you today with some things that I want you to think about in your game as you go into the spring season and that just maybe you might need to consider to change or develop in order for you to elevate your ceiling. Because that's I think about that stuff a lot. Man, do I think about that stuff a lot. I get people coming in here. I've been teaching for 24 years. Been fortunate enough to be the director of instruction at World Golf Village, King and Bear Slammer and Squire. Been fortunate enough to be the director of instruction at TPC Sawgrass. Been fortunate enough to, to, to be on air at Golf Channel for five years. Been fortunate enough to build this studio and over this time have many, many conversations with professional golfers, the top teachers in the game, and then try to put that in my head in a way that I can convey it to you 
in where you might be in your golf game right now and the next steps that you might need to be able to take. And that is a big task because there's a lot of different patterns. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of different patterns in full swing and in short game, which is where I want to start today. Because the short game discussion about whether to use the leading edge or not is one that has really taken off, right? It, you know, look, there's, uh, there's certainly a, a camp that's like, look, let's utilize the bounce. Let's shallow things out. Let's not get the leading edge on the ground. Let's decompress shaft lean. And then on the other side, there's... No, let's steepen the attack angle. Let's get the leading edge more on the ground and let's lean the shaft more forward. And there's no question, there's great examples of both. For example, those watching on my YouTube channel, thank you for being here. Here's Jordan Spieth. He's pretty good at short game. A lot of these guys from Texas are good at short game. Spieth, Scheffler. They can get that leading edge on the ground, right? That wind's blowing. Maybe some firm ground. Watch Spieth. going to lean the shaft forward. Left wrist flat. Spieth leans the shaft forward. Scheffler leans the shaft forward much more than you're going to see, I would say, others lean the shaft forward at impact on in the professional game. Now, I'm going to play this again. And the first thing that you see, and I just got it going just a little too quick there, but the first thing you're going to see is with Spieth is he's a bit aggressive with the shaft lean at address. His left wrist is flat. And when the left wrist is flat, that shaft is going to be more forward and in line with your lead arm. Now, for those of you that are just listening, I'm going to explain this the very best that I can. In fact, if you were just to stand up nice and tall and take your left arm and extend it out in front of you, where your left arm is at a right angle to your shoulders, not across your chest, but straight out in front of you. And then you were to take your pitching wedge and your grip and you were to make a straight line with your left arm in the shaft. That left wrist is flat, okay? Now, if you were to take your left arm of the shaft, swing it back across your chest, and then drop it down with the ball position back in the stance like Jordan does, now the left wrist is flat, the shaft is forward, and in line with the left arm. When you have that flattish left wrist condition, and that shaft is forward and in line with the lead arm, that club head, when it comes down into impact, that club head wants to continue to move down. So it gets on the ball. And then after the ball, that club head wants to continue to move down through the strike until it kind of clears that left shoulder position. I've always looked at this, the left shoulder as like the center of the arc, right? The arc is going around you and the center of your is your left shoulder. You make the left arm straight and the shaft, which is the radius, measured out to the end of the circle, and you drop that down. When that left wrist is flat, that club head wants to continue to move down until it clears the left shoulder. And so with the shaft forward, the leading edge is more on the ground. These guys are very clever in the way that they want to get it out of the ground. Spieth has always been one where he kind of takes the left elbow and the left elbow folds. He does that a little bit in his full swing. You'll see players working that left shoulder back up and around. The handle's going to raise a little bit. And that gets the club head out of the ground. They're brilliant at that. Scheffler's brilliant at that. But this is a, an approach, shaft forward, left wrist flat. It's going to come into impact with more shaft and get the leading edge on the ground. What you have to know is the club head wants to continue to move down for a longer period of time until it clears the left shoulder. So you've got to get it up out of the ground, left elbow, left shoulder, et cetera, turning all of those things. The other part of that would be when we go to, let's go to this one here. So we're going to take that one off and we're going to bring in oh, Mr. Luke Donald. Come on out. Here we go. It's coming up now. There's Luke. Luke Dollar, and again, wonderful short game player. Similar type of shot. Difference here is, is you don't see as much shaft lean, right? Subtle, 
left wrist has a little bit more extension to it. So this is not a straight line. This is not a straight line in line with the left arm to the left shoulder. There's a, there's a bit more extension, if you will, on the left wrist. Now, with that bit more extension in the left wrist, when that club head swings down, it wants to swing back up on its own sooner as it clears the left wrist. When the left wrist is not flat, it's more extended. Now that left wrist becomes more of the low point. Left wrist is flat. Club head wants to continue to move down longer until it clears the left shoulder. Left wrist a little bit more extended. Club head wants to move down until it clears the left wrist, which is right there. It's not as, you know, it's not as far up, if you will, in the arc. And so the shaft lane comes in a bit more conservative. It's not on the leading edge as much. Club head wants to swing up out of the ground sooner. That's a different type of method, different type of style. And Luke Donald's very good at that. And so those are two different styles that you can sign up for. Now, I think to have a great short game, can you, are you able to kind of do both? Probably so, right? But I do think, I do think even at the highest level, guys will gravitate to what they're good at, right? I think Spieth and Scheffler are going to gravitate to more of that leading edge kind of shot. Um, guys that are comfortable throwing it up in the air are going to gravitate to a little bit more bounce, right? Less leading edge. But I think at the end of the day, you've got to be able to probably do some of the both, or a little bit of both. Now, to the masses, here's where I'm going to hang my hat more times than not. To the masses, the amateur player, I'm going to try to create an environment in building short game more times than not where I want to get the club head to enter, hit the ball first, and then get out of the ground, right? There's a point of entry, and then the club head getting out of the ground, the exit out of the ground. And I want to create an environment where the point of entry is going to be on the ball, but the leading edge is not going to get caught in the ground, generally speaking, right? So the club head comes down into the ball, and then it gets out of the ground. They're not just getting it on the ball, and the club head just gets caught in the ground. The, lead, the club head wants to continue to move down, and the leading edge gets caught in the ground. Even though we catch the ball first, we have to manage the ball speed a little bit more. Even though we caught the ground first, it's in my head that, God, that felt fat. And then we hit it slightly fat, and we lay the sod over, and it goes three feet, and then that becomes a little bit more psychological. I've been through that journey. I've had this conversation with Parker McLaughlin many times. There's a lot of people that have been through that journey of getting the leading edge on the ground and hitting it fat one every eight, nine, ten times, but it lives in your head rent-free, and it affects the development of your short game. Not everybody, but I think a lot of people. And so, to me, for the masses and building the short game, I'm going to try to get the club head on the ball, and then out of the ground, clean, without the leading edge getting caught in the ground. That's kind of my goal for the masses. And so in doing that, where I like to start with people is, is, is getting the ball positioned in the middle of the stance, feet, you know, 10, 12 inches apart, and then talking to them about their sternum first. In the short game, put my arm down like this, like, you know, just level to the my shoulders right now are level. I'm going to tilt my left shoulder down just a little bit. Okay, so my left shoulder is left for a right-handed player. That's opposite than, than the full swing, right? In the full swing, I would tilt to the right. You know, with my driver, I would tilt to the right and maybe even feel like I'm a bit closed. My shoulders would feel like they're a bit more closed to the right. Short game. I'm going to feel just slightly left shoulder lower. I'm going to feel my shoulders a bit more open. I'm going to feel my, my uh, pelvis, maybe even position a bit more to the right. You know, so I can get my sternum a bit more left. And I can actually put more weight left as a function of more of my upper body rather than driving my lower, my pelvis, my hips forward, which then kind of leaves my spine to the right. And so in doing that, now I've got a little weight left. I've got my sternum a little bit out ahead of the ball. 
I'm going to lean the shaft slightly forward, not to the point where my left wrist is flat, not to the point where the leading edge is going to be um, completely on the ground. I'm going to lean it slightly forward. And then from there, I'm going to keep that sternum there. I'm going to take it back with a little baby hinge. I'm going to let the club head fall. It's going to get right on top of that ball because my sternum's out ahead of it a little bit. And then the club head's going to want to get out of the ground because I'm not sustaining that left wrist being flat, leaning the handle forward. That club head's going to want to clear the left wrist, get up out of the ground as I turn my chest through. So I hit the ball first, and then the club head got out of the ground cleanly. That's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with that baseline shot. I'm not going to get the leading edge excessively on the ground over and over and over and over again for the masses. Now, as I start building that, that point of entry through the stern, they start getting comfortable catching the ball first, turning with it, club heads getting out of the ground, we're clipping it nicely, plenty of friction there. Then I might start adding some variability. Okay, now let's move it back. Let's lean the shaft a little bit more forward. The left wrist is a bit flatter. Let's take it up the same way. Now it's going to get on the ground. Leading edge is going to be in there. we got to make sure we turn through. That's a different style shot. It's going to feel different at the bottom with the leading edge on the ground. It's going to look different coming off the face. And so you can start building that in as the point of entry cleans up, as they get comfortable turning through, not worrying about the stickiness at the bottom then we can add some variability to it. So that's something for you to think about. That's kind of the way that I would go about it to the masses. And as you watch professional golf, these guys are so damn talented. You know, they can, you know, there's, there's certainly examples of both sides. Let's go to the full swing. As you evaluate, man, my phone is like blowing up right now. Hold on a second. And people texting me heck is going on right now all right here we go so let's go to the full swing the first thing that i want you to ask yourself in your full swing is your club face a problem is your club face a problem is your club face in your swing is it too open is it about right square or is it too closed do you find that your club face is overriding things at impact? Like I just, you, you know, there's some people that just feel like, man, my, I feel like my swing shape's pretty good, but the face is just too open. And so I feel the need that I have to do something at the bottom to square it up. Others, you know, they feel the club face open and then they feel like they got to, you know, do something on the downswing kind of over the top to pull across it to, to hit their slice. What's interesting, the the lower handicaps will tend to man will tend to overcome the face more at the bottom. Higher handicaps will start, you know, doing their thing straight from the top. Higher handicaps, open face going back, they come over it. You know, they really dive across that path. Works hard to the left. Hey, you get away with the wedge nine eight. Get up to those middle irons, longer irons. Mm, not so much. Driver can have a big slice on it. Lower handicaps get the face open. They'll bring it down pretty good. You know, they'll bring it down a little from the inside, but then at the bottom, then they'll they'll just sacrifice shaft length. They'll flip it. And so they'll 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 uh, not lean the shaft forward. It'll be more neutral to get that face around. They usually can hit it pretty straight, but they don't hit it as far as they should because they're adding loft. Closed club face players, you think about your club face being maybe too closed, perhaps, and, and it's like, man, I just, I'm just fighting this hook. Um, I just feel like I have to hold on to it because it's going to, you know, it's going to go to the left, so I have to hold on and to make it go straight, not, not let it rotate over. Lower handicaps, shut face, they may get it too much from the inside. They get the path going too far out to the right. So they hit a lot of push draws, but they can hit a lot of big blocks and they can hit some occasional hooks. So is the club face out of position? 
do you need to get the club face more closed? Do you need to get the club face more open to try to find more of that neutral face position? That's a big conversation, but it's one that I want you to ask yourself where you're at. Where are you at in your swing? There's two influences to the face that I'm going to just kind of share with you. One is the grip. Generally speaking, for a right-handed player, if, if you had a weak grip, your left thumb would be down the middle. And your left thumb would be down the middle. That V would be to your chin, right hand on top, V to the chin. That's weak. If you moved your hands a little to the right, now the Vs are to the right ear. That's neutral. If you kept going to the right, now the Vs are to the right shoulder. That's strong. Generally speaking, the stronger the grip, the more the club face wants to close. Okay. I can remember doing many, many corporate events. And as you're working the line, like if you want to make an impact on a club face and you're watching and it's like, wow, that club face is so open. And you go to the grip and you make it stronger to the right. You know that club face is going to, is going to close automatically. You got to be careful with that because the second influence to the club face would be wrist angles. Right, I can take it up to the top and take my left wrist and flex it more. Flex my left wrist, extend my right wrist for a right-handed player, and that's going to shut the face more. I can take it up to the top and get my left wrist extended, cupped more, and that's going to open the face. So I, you have to factor in the grip type with what the wrist angles are. For the masses... For the masses, generally speaking, it seems that more times than not, you're going to have to try to get that club face a little bit more closed in the backswing slash transition. Because still, a lot of you, when you get into this game, you may have a neutral grip but you still take the club face back and you extend the left wrist and it gets open and then you feel like you've got to overcome that and that stumps progression so again for the masses i think more times than not there's still that there's still that predominant fault of the face wanting to rotate to open and so it's like all right Let's get the grip to the right a little bit, kind of neutral, maybe slightly strong. Let's get it back. Let's let's make sure we're not too extending the left wrist, right? Let's get that left wrist, you know, relatively flat if we can. And then in transition, that club face still is good. And then, you know, we're hitting shots from there. Now, if you're someone on the other side of that and the face is too shut, then we have to have that conversation. But the point is, is where are you at grip wrist angles? Is the club face in position for you to develop? Because the next conversation I want to have is about swing shape. And swing shape, here is, here's a good picture. Jake Knapp has really good swing shape. It was awesome to, to have his coach, John Ortigi. He came to the studio when he was in town for the players. And I just love these. Um, I just love the stories of a player and a coach who've been together since they were like 9 or 10 years old. I think it's really cool. So Jake's a player that gets the face pretty square, maybe slightly closed. If you look at Jake's club face at the top there, you can see the angle of the face is roughly to the left arm. Club face turned up to the sky slightly, right? Like you always want to see the club face a little bit. If that club face starts to hide and hang to the left too much at the top, that's open. If that club face is pretty matched up to the left arm, fairly square. If the club face is turned up to the sky, like a Victor Hovland or Dustin Johnson, then that's shut. And so when you look at Jake, now I want to talk about swing shape. And the first picture with Jake, actually, let me take a step back. Because I want to set the stage here for, for the masses listening about swing shape and how the club moves around you going back and then coming down. This is something I talk about all of the time. Sometimes in conjunction with the club face, sometimes not. But when you look at swing shape, I think for the masses, more times than not, the initial move going back is the clubbed head needs to feel like it's moving up and out in front of the hands a little bit. But that doesn't mean you move your hands away from your body. Yeah, your hands are, you know, attached to your left arm. Your left arm's attached to your torso, left shoulder there being the, the low point of the arc. You're turning 
And when you turn, your hand path is going to start moving in. But because the club head is on the ground, the club head has to work up. It has to work up and it has to feel like it's a little out in front of the hands. I think that is what most of the masses need to feel. Because if there's one thing that I see more times than not, and I know there's probably at least 300 people listening to this, maybe more, that suck that club head too far inside. Now, can you do that and get away with it? Of course. Matthew Fitzpatrick. Right? There's always examples of this. But I'm going to tell you right now, you suck that club head in behind the hands early, and I'll make the statement for the masses, it stumps growth big time. Now, you keep the club head up and out in front. Now, you can turn. Now, you can start maximizing the turn. You can start lengthening out the swing more as you see with Jake Knapp, which I love. Right hip turning. Look at the little window in between the left knee and the right knee. I love that. I think that's a wonderful checkpoint for those watching and listening. Go stand next to a mirror. Put the mirror to the right of you. Take it back to the top. Give me a little change in deflex. Give me a little window in there. Love it. But don't suck it inside. Club head up and out, then turn. It's going up the top side of the plane. It's going up the top side of the sheet of glass. And then we turn and let the left arm work around you. Love it. From there, don't lay it off. <laughs> don't lay it off. You know, it just, it, we're going to get to that here in a second. But what I've noticed is if you get the club head working up and out a little bit first, and then you make a nice full turn, you let the right hip turn, you let a little flexion in the right knee change, you let the left knee come across, you let the right shoulder peel back behind you, you let the left shoulder work back behind the ball. Like the club usually gets pretty close to where it needs to be. Parallel, Generally speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the club a little across the line, more so than I am laid off. And from there, change of direction. That shaft, look at it, starts to shell out to that right form. Look at the club head pitched back behind the hands. That's really the key. I mean, you, like, you don't need this big Matthew Wolf shallowing out. You don't need that. But you got to get the club head pitched back behind the hand some. Like, you know, if, if you're sitting here and you're like a mid-handicap and you've never felt that before, like your, your ceiling is not as high as you can get it. And there's different reasons why the club shaft might steepen a little in transition. There's different reasons for that. And one of them is an inside takeaway, which I fix all day. And then I watch it over a period of time where the club head gets out and up, and then I get them fully maximized in their turn, and I let them go. And you know what they do? The club shaft pitches back behind, and all of a sudden, now they can start to open up better through impact. The shaft starts leaning more forward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these boxes start getting checked because of how you shaped it going back. This whole idea of the backswing doesn't matter is complete BS, Twitter warriors. All that matters, Travis, is impact. Yeah, I get that. That's what the ball knows. But in the world of development, it doesn't work that way. In the world of developing the masses of amateur golfers, which I've been doing for 24 years, it doesn't work that way. You've got to put the time into the backswing. And oh, by the way, no one talks to more professional golfers than I, or professional, the top coaches in the game than I do. And you, when I ask them what they're working on with their players, do you know what the answer is? Eight, nine out of 10 times, backswing. <laughs> backswing. What's JT working on? <sighs> Rotating that face open, you know, I mean, he's uh, getting up that top side of that shaft. What's Ricky Fowler working on? Backswing. What's Rory working on? Backswing, hands higher, shaft pitch back more. 
You know what Scotty Shuffler works on when he struggles a little bit? With Randy Smith, gets the face a little too open at the top. So don't tell me the backswing don't matter. It matters. What these guys work on. Go watch them on the range. Eight out of ten, backswing. Then you have the occasional Alex Noren doing his, you know, just digging the hole left. Over the top. That's his feeling. So what is your swing shape? Do you get the club head too far inside? Then up, then over. Do you get the club head pretty good like Jake there, but you're not getting enough depth? You're not getting it around you enough. What does your swing shape look like? Start with the backswing first. Then from there, if that's good, then where is it coming down? Where is the shaft pitching coming down? And then from there, where does the shaft exit? Look at the swing shape in that order. What does it do going back? What does it do in transition? And then what does it do in the exit plane? But Jake, you can see it's back under the left shoulder. And these guys can rotate hard left because they get the shaft pitched back some going coming down. Alex Noren can cover it left. Victor Hovland can cover it left because they get the shaft pitched back some coming down. The club head's behind the hands. It's not steepening. They're not casting. They're not fly fishing. They're getting the club, the sweet spot back behind, and then they can turn. Okay, so th this is a little bit about swing shape. That first one on the left, yeah, I pay attention to that. I clean it up more times than not. And then I get them to fully turn to the top. And as they fully turn to the top, the one thing that I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at where is that club at the top. Now, this is where you get into the conversation about the shaft being laid off or not. What does your club shaft look like at the top? I'm not a big laid off guy. I'm just not. I, you know, that's Daniel Berger back in his day. Um, there are some guys that that do get it a little left at the top, too left at the top. If I drew a line from the ball through the butt of the club, that shaft would be left of that plane line. That's an easy way to look at it. You look at Daniel Berger now at the bottom. If I drew a line in that middle one there at the top from the ball through the butt of the club, that shaft would be right on that plane line. Okay, so that's kind of an easy way to see where the shaft is in space. So you look at that at the bottom. And, and you can see the club head is slightly left of the hands. Technically, that's not laid off. Okay, that's not laid off. I can draw a line from the ball through the butt of the club. That shaft is on that plane. Now, up top there in the middle, if I drew a line from the ball through the butt of the club, it's left of that plane. Now, to me, that's laid off. And when I see laid off shafts, to the masses, what I see in transition is they pull down on that. So now the handle wants to work more vertically in transition, and that's tough. That's tough to overcome on the downswing because the higher handicap with that steeper shaft is going to rotate hard to the left. They're going to hit a lot of pulls. They're going to hit a lot of phase, and they're going to clank it off the toe like three out of five times. Unless you stop turning at impact, and you really early extend and get the handle higher, that'll help keep it off the toe and get it more on the center of the face. But you're never probably going to quit early extending. Now, Berger, through his work with Mark Blackburn, they got the club a little bit more on plane. I think the shaft's going to pitch a little bit better for him coming down in transition, and that's probably going to clean him up a little bit through rotation through the bottom. Now, there are guys that you watch that, that get that club a little laid off at the top and they don't pull down on it. They kind of, you know, they just let the club kind of fall, right? You know, Jerry Kelly get, had, had a little bit of that. I think Rom has a little bit of that. Even though Rom's shaft does steepen a little, like, they, you know, he, it's, not, it's not a ton. They just kind of let it fall and then they turn. So that's, you know, look, that, that's a way to do it too. The one thing that, the other thing I don't like about a laid off shaft, and this is something that I think you're seeing with Xander Shoffley right now. Chris Como has worked to get the shaft pointing a little bit more down the line, a little less laid off. When you get laid off, you can get short with your turn. Like you can get up to the top and you can get short with the turn. You get a little runoff with the arms and the shaft lays off. When you turn the shaft more down the line or what feels across the line, your left shoulder starts to work more back behind the ball. You get a deeper turn. And so Xander is a player to me who's added distance 
by getting the shaft less laid off. It's lengthened him out properly. It's more on plane. When he starts down, now the shaft wants to pitch more behind him, which is a good thing. So there's some other value and benefit to not getting the shaft laid off. John Rom shows up to the studio. Are you trying to get the shaft less laid off? Hell no. <laughs> you know, you got to work around things, right? Like there's, 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 uh, everybody's at a different level. And golf means different things to different people. But for the masses who play, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, and they want to make this game as easy as possible, why not just shape it better going back? Here's a player that I had, and I'll finish with this. This is um, uh, a guy here, excellent athlete, played college football, college baseball. And he's just the opposite. You know, he's thick-chested, makes a pretty good turn, but, but you know, he's just not he, – we're not going to get this thing lengthened out much more than this. That club would get pretty vertical if I drew a line from the ball through the butt of the club on the left. Now the shaft's to the right of it. So now the club is a little bit across the line. But because of the shorter nature of the swing, I've, I've elected to get the shaft a little bit more rotated. And you can see the club head pointing a bit more to the left of the hands. That's not laid off. Is it more laid off than it was? Yes. But it's not laid off. It's more on plane. In fact, if anything, it's probably still just slightly across the line. And so... I elected to get the shaft more here, quote, more laid off because it's a little shorter in nature. He's not going to get this thing fully lengthened out um, with his body type. It's going to be a little easier for him from that position for the shaft just to kind of fall, club head stay a bit behind him, and then from there turn. He's already starting to feel the benefit of that. He doesn't feel as steep. He doesn't feel the need coming down to have to early extend and get the handle to, to, to come up. And that move really is problematic with the driver. That's where he gets the big block and, and the occasional hook. And so body types you have to take into consideration. And if it's short, then I'm going to get the club, yeah, a bit more rotated right there. But if I can lengthen it out, if I can lengthen it out and maximize that turn, I will. And we'll get that club pushing parallel, if anything. For some, they got to feel a little bit across the line for the masses. For some, just don't get laid off, man, right? Don't suck the club head in. Don't get laid off if you're a 23 handicap. You know, like those are, those are the things that I, that go through my mind um, as we're working here. So, you know, so that's swing shape, right? That's swing shape. And the sequence of it is <clears throat> the club head, you know, kind of works a little up and out. Then, then I turn. Then it goes around me. I think a lot feel like the club head's got to stay low and it's got to go around, in and around early. And they think that because they, they're trying to hit the inside of the ball coming down. And so they're like, I'm going to take it. I'm just going to take it inside. And then I'll just, it doesn't work that way. What usually goes in, then goes up, and then you come over. Not always, but more times than not. So the club head works a little out and up. Then I turn. Now it goes around me. Now in the change of direction, the shaft wants to pitch back. And now from there, wow, you've got a lot of boxes checked, especially if the club face looks good. you got a lot of boxes checked. And as you check those boxes, then the discussion can start to be, all right, here's the downswing. Here's a weight chip. Here's rotation. Here's some shaft lean. You know, all these things start to, they start to develop. They start to find their way based off the new club face and or swing shape. And my rule of thumb is this, and I'll finish with this as I'm working with people. You know, I'll go to the club face, right? That's, that, was, that was number one, you know, grip you know, grip and wrist angle. I'll, I'll go to the club face, and as I go to the club face, then I'm looking at swing shape. So sometimes I'm working on club face and swing shape at the same time, sometimes not. But as I'm going to the club face and I'm going to the swing shape, if the body's in the way, Right. If the body is in the way, it has a major fault. It has a sway. It has a reverse pivot. Then I will fix the body. But if I can get the body to follow the pattern, right, then that's what I'm going to do. I think there's a, there's a great um, concept 
that I learned years ago from the golfing machine. I think the golfing machine had a lot of great stuff to it. I don't think it was right about everything, nor do I think anything's right about everything. I'm not right about everything. In fact, I might be just blowing smoke up your ass right now. I don't know. But there's a great concept in the golfing machine that <clears throat> there was a hands-controlled pivot. And that was a, a big moment for me in my in my career. Hands controlled pivot. Like you're telling your hands what to do. You're telling your hands what, you know, kind of what to do here and here. Like you're giving your hands direction. You're like, hey, hands, go up here. Or hands, get behind me, depth. Hey, hands, left wrist, get flatter versus extended. So you're educating your hands. And as a function of that, your pivot is responding. I can, I can affect the pivot so much, so much without even talking about the pivot. Hands controlled pivot. If the pivot is in the way, then I'm going to fix the pivot. And there always comes to a point with, with some students where it's the other way around. It's the pivot controlled hands, right? And, and sometimes the narrative is that way. It's you're, you're telling your pivot what to do. And as a function of that, your hands are responding. And so sometimes in the world of development, you go both ways with people, right? Like it's sometimes the narrative is kind of hands controlled pivot and you get so much done and you don't wear them out with, with um, language that they don't even need to hear. But sometimes it's gotta be pivot controlled hands. Sometimes like it has to be, look, here, here's what I need your pivot to do. In fact, drop the club crisscross your arms, okay, and let's let's turn this way. Let's get your right hip to pull back, not slide. Let's get your left shoulder across. Let's let your right shoulder peel back behind you. Let's not stay down, right? Let your spine extend. I need you to shift your weight on your downswing. Let, let, your, let your left shoulder, left knee feel like it puts pressure into the ground, and then from there, let yourself rotate and your left leg's going to push up. Like, so you have to have those deeper conversations. Sometimes it's in, a, it's, it's in the manner of fixing the pivot, or I'm sorry, sometimes it's in the manner of fixing the pivot, and so you can get the club and your hands and arms to do the right thing. Sometimes it's just that you want it to move faster and more efficiently. And so there's times for that. Hands-controlled pivot, pivot-controlled hands, interesting conversation, one that I toggle back and forth with, with students. But I got to tell you, for the masses, hands-controlled pivot, man, is a, is a great way to get a lot of stuff done without, without uh, you know, feeling like you're just talking all the time like I've been doing here in this podcast. <laughs> so anyway, those are some things to consider, right? Those are some things to consider in, in the golf swing. Club face, swing shape, and then I would say, what is, what is your pivot doing? Do, do you have body faults? Do you have major body faults? Do you have a sway in the backswing? Do you have a reverse spine angle? Do you have a lack of weight shift coming down? Do you have a lack of rotation through impact? The answer to those body faults gets a little bit more difficult because you have to factor in what your swing shape is and or what your club face is doing because so often the body is just responding to what you've preloaded into the club face and swing shape. And so for me, I always attack it in that order. Club face, swing shape, what's your body doing? Hopefully that helps. All right, that's enough. I can't talk anymore. Short game, full swing. I'm here for you. Let's work together. Long distance. I'm on the Skillless app. I'm teaching a ton. Back at it in the studio about golf simulators. True Spec is my partner. They are unbelievable. We had a huge month here in club fitting. Huge. Come see me this spring or summer. I'm here. Or if not, let's set up a long distance plan. Email me, Travis, at TravisFultonGolf.com. Have a great week. Masters is next week. Scotty Scheffler is going to win by five, isn't he? See you later.